Well, good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. For more than half a century, Hollywood liberals and America's foreign policy establishment eyed each other with suspicion. From Vietnam to Iraq, actors were often the harshest critics of whatever wars Washington was pushing at the time. A lot has changed, though. The rise of Donald Trump has caused elites from across the spectrum to realize they've got a lot more in common with each other than they do with the American middle class. Suddenly, liberals in L.A. are warming to the idea of pointless foreign wars. Rob Reiner is an actor, a director, a liberal. He now has a group designed to investigate Russian interference in the last election. He's joined forces with all kinds of pro-war conservatives in Washington. Here's their latest ad. Listen carefully. We have been attacked. We are at war. The free world is counting on us for leadership. For 241 years, our democracy has been a shining example to the world of what we can all aspire to. And we owe it to the brave people who have fought and died to protect this great nation and save democracy. And we owe it to our future generations to continue the fight. So there's Morgan Freeman working for Rob Reiner in league with longtime war enthusiasts in Washington like David Frum and Max Boot telling us we're at war. So when does the bombing start exactly? We sat down with Rob Reiner to ask him that question. Watch. So we're at war. How would you respond if President Trump took you seriously and sent the B-52s to St. Petersburg or blockaded the Gulf of Finland? How would, would you support that? Uh, no. Well, when we say we're at war, we're talking about a cyber war. Uh, it, it, it's... it doesn't make that clear. It just says we're Morgan Freeman, who everyone trusts his voice. You know, <laughs> folks in media trust in everyone. We're at war. So but you don't really believe we're at war. Why are you saying it then? Well, because if you watch the entire uh, video, it talks about cyber warfare. It talks about how he was able to use, uh, you know, the Internet and, and cyber tools to uh, attack the democracy, which is what they did. But shouldn't you say somewhere in there, we're not really at war. I mean, we're just kind of taking creative license. We're just trying to get you all pumped up. It's not really war. Like, we shouldn't respond as you would as if you were in a war. Why not just say that so you don't confuse people? Well, I'd say if you watch the whole video, I did. You, you wouldn't be confused about it. I mean, the, the thing that I've always uh, felt is that, you know, people don't really understand the capacity for cyber warfare beyond the obvious stuff of, you know, hacking into people's computers or right. using the Internet. Uh, uh, you know, Facebook, we now find out, you know, that they were using uh, Facebook to push out certain kind of propaganda. Propaganda has been around forever. I mean, you know, from Lenny Riefenstahler on. So we've, we've had plenty of propaganda. Oh, I've noticed. Right. But, but, but the point well, is. The point right. is that beyond the propaganda, there there are other uh, aspects to cyber warfare uh, that have been used. We've used it. Uh, the Russians have used it. And we have to make people aware of the capacity of this cyber warfare beyond sowing uh, distrust and uh, confusion in, in democratic society. Right. I mean, a couple of things. First, you've allied yourself with people like Max Boot and David Frum, who have long advocated for real wars, hot wars. Both of them were big advocates of the war in Iraq, predicated on the idea that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. I think you made a movie. Uh, actually on that subject that's coming out later this month, taking the other side. But are you a little bit concerned you've wound up linked to people who are advocating and have over decades a series of actual wars where people die? Are you comfortable with that? Well, I, we have, you know, we have people from on all sides. I mean, uh, there's Norm Orenstein. We have uh, James Same. Clapper, who is the Same. Uh, director of, of national intelligence. And there are many supporters. Norman Lear is a supporter. We have liberals and uh, hawks and doves, as, as, as you say, right. on, on both sides. So we're not advocating uh, going to war or going oh, to a say that. traditional war with Russia. Okay. But we are already 
in a cyber war with them. And, right. and uh, if people, I, people want to turn their heads away from that, it, it's at their own peril. The, the point I'd like to make, and this is really important for people to understand, because this really doesn't have uh, anything to do with Donald Trump, trust me, because Donald Trump, uh, whatever happens to him, is going to happen to him. I mean, there right. are already investigations. Mueller's going to find what he finds the House and Senate have their own investigations. They'll find whatever they find. But beyond that, we, we've been invaded in a certain way. And the thing that has been so upsetting to me, and, and I don't know how old you are, Tucker, but, you know, oh. I can remember when I had to hide under a desk during the Cold War in the 50s because we were worried that we were going to get attacked, you know, uh, by a nuclear uh, bomb. And, and it, whenever the, the country has been attacked in one way or another, whether it was Pearl Harbor or 9-11, we've always come together as a country to defend ourselves against uh, enemy, foreign enemies, you know? And this is the first time, because I think we're so divided as a country, right. and we know we are. Well, that, but maybe that here's, here's part of the we reason. No, but here's maybe together. part of the reason, because wait, wait, it's so... I mean, perhaps this is... I agree with you. We are very divided, and maybe this is one of the reasons... A lot of this is deeply disingenuous. Anyone who looks at cyber warfare will tell you, any honest person will say, the Chinese military is the primary culprit in the United States, hacked into the White House not that long ago, into the computer system there, into almost every federal agency. Nobody said anything. You guys in Hollywood sell your movies in China. You bow to the imperatives of their propaganda and censorship office. You change your movies to suit them. And yet yeah, but no one says we're at war with China. And I wonder why. So you're sucking up to this regime that has actually broken in and stolen industrial and military secrets that hurt this country. You say nothing until Hillary Clinton loses and all of a sudden we're at war with Russia. Can you see why some of us are saying, well, wait a second, Rob Reiner, where were you with China? Why are you selling your movies over there? I, I'm, Fair I'm, question? I, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not giving uh, China a free pass here. Well, of course what, you are. Well, I mean, no, you, guys, you guys, you guys in Hollywood sell your movies there and you allow their censorship office to change your movies in order to make money. Yeah, so well, I, they're I breaking don't personally in. do that because oh, I don't. Come on, everybody who sells a movie in China does that. You know that. I mean, let's stop, <laughs> you know what I mean, kind of BSing a little bit. I mean, that's real, right? Yeah, but, you know, here's the, the difference, the difference, Tucker, is that, you know, the Chinese have done some stuff. We've done stuff. We've done stuff oh. uh, way worse, too. Uh, and, and every oh, side does it. Oh, so you can't really it. judge, wait, wait, but we're going to judge Russia because why? Okay, but no, I'm no, just no, saying no, it just doesn't uh, make sense. not letting me make a point here. <laughs> Go ahead. You're not letting uh, you know, we know about Stuxnet. We know the capacity for cyber warfare. It's not just about hacking into uh, uh, computers and stealing uh, information. It's about using that information and weaponizing it in some way. Now, you can weaponize it in, in, in uh, uh, propaganda, which it has been done in this way, or it can be actually weaponized in a physical way to disrupt power plants, water supplies, and so on. Right. The Russians have done that in the Ukraine. Uh, we, uh, like I say, Stuxnet, uh, we did that in, in Iran. Th this is not a surprise. The point right. is, we're now at this point where we have to understand the capacity here so I, that we can put in you. place the kinds of uh, okay. uh, uh, measures we need very, very to, to defend let, let ourselves explain, and protect you didn't, ourselves. You didn't, I agree with everything you just said. I let you explain. I love but you that didn't you answer, agreed with that. You didn't answer my question, which what was is, the question? the question is, if China is a bigger violator in the United States than Russia, and I think everyone agrees that it is, why are they not in your movie? Well, the, 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 but China is, has not insinuated themselves directly into our democratic process, into our well, elections. Are you being serious? Of course they have. I mean, they've stolen information directly from the U.S. government, from no. our political figures, from the yeah. Pentagon, from CIA, oh, from the yeah. White House. If they're not in our political system, then I don't understand no, no, what I the definition is. I didn't say that they weren't in the political mm. system. Of course they are. What I'm right. saying is they didn't utilize that material to try to oh, affect an election in some way. I get it. You okay, know. So you can see why maybe some of us are a little bit skeptical. Maybe you're not selling as many movies in Russia as you are in China. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> Good luck with David Frum and Max Food. Good to see you, Rob. Thank nice you. Nice to see you. Willis Krumholtz writes at The Federalist and has covered this subject pretty extensively. Willis, thanks a lot for joining us tonight. So I, I don't want to be cynical, but I find it a little striking that 
The United States has been the subject of repeated cyber attacks by China, and I didn't hear anybody on the left say anything about it. And all of a sudden, they have PhDs in cyber warfare and are calling for war with Russia, which, if anything, is, is less an offender. Is it all political, do you think? Yeah, it seems like so now, Tucker. Um, you, you're exactly right that there's, to say the least, some ideological, ideological consistencies in the D.C. establishment and on the left when it comes to uh, uh, our, our foreign, invent, our foreign uh, interventions and uh, when, it, when it comes to um, how we see China and how we see the rest of the world. It does seem that way. I mean, let's just get back to the, to the core claim here, and that is that Russia hacked our election or hacked our democracy. We've talked about it for 10 months now. I'm still not sure that I understand how exactly Russia hacked our democracy. Are we certain of that? No, we're not, Tucker. So let's just talk about the DNC hack specifically. So first of all, um, true or not, the entire narrative of Russian election interference started as a Hillary Clinton campaign talking point. The DNC um, only announced it was hacked by Russia two days after WikiLeaks announced it had information that said uh, Clinton campaign and the DNC were uh, basically colluding to mistreat Bernie Sanders. And that provided the Clinton campaign an incredible talking point going into the Democratic National Convention to distract from uh, the fact that they were mistreating Bernie. The second thing is that the FBI repeatedly asked to examine the DNC servers, and the DNC repeatedly refused. So only CrowdStrike, a private cybersecurity firm bought and paid for by the DNC with ideological ties to the Clinton campaign, looked at the DNC's servers. And so we have to trust that CrowdStrike, uh, when it passed along information to the FBI, that that information was an accurate representation of what was on the DNC servers at the time. And third, let's just say we trust CrowdStrike and the Democrats, the forensics or the, or the information that showed a hack passed along to the FBI were far from conclusive. A lot of the evidence is being used in a way that's analogous to saying, um, look, Tucker, I'm at a crime scene. I see an AK-47 on the ground. The last shooter must be a Russian. There's a logical flaw in that, and the Obama administration agreed that there was a logical flaw in that, and that's why they waited the entire summer of 2016 to attribute that uh, hack to Russia. And when they did, uh, they did so under uh, somewhat suspect circumstances. So it, it would be really striking to conclude, as we may at some point, that all of this is built on air or a lie. Very specifically, though, why did the DNC not allow federal investigators access to their servers? Was there a reason for that? We really don't know, Tucker. And, and that's kind of the problem here is it's not that Russia for sure did or didn't um, interfere in our election, but the degree that the, the degree to which Russia interfered and our election is definitely open up, open for debate and open for more investigation. And we, this is one of the areas we don't have uh, good answers on why the DNC refused uh, access to no. the FBI. And he, go ahead, Tucker. Well, it's just, I mean, just the whole thing. I mean, we've altered the course of our foreign policy. We've changed American political history. We put the entire city on hold. And yet nobody has answered the most basic questions like what happened? I think it's bizarre. Willis, thanks a lot for joining us tonight and for shedding a little light on that. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Tucker. Of course. According to new reports, President Obama's U.N. ambassador tried to unmask the identities of spied-upon U.S. citizens, not rarely, but on a daily basis, sometimes more than once a day. Up next, we'll look at what this says about the ethics of the Obama administration and ask the obvious question, which is, why were they doing that exactly? Plus, Hillary Clinton didn't focus enough on the elect college, and she lost. Now she says it's time to get rid of the electoral college because it's a threat to democracy or something. We'll talk to someone who agrees just ahead. This is a Fox News alert. The island of Puerto Rico took a direct hit from Hurricane Maria yesterday. Early estimates of the damage suggest it's awful. The entire island has lost power. A FEMA administrator, Brock Long, says it could take six months to restore electricity to parts of the island. Abner Gomez, who was the Commonwealth's emergency director, bluntly stated the island has been, quote, destroyed. So far, two deaths in Puerto Rico have been reported so far, but there's a lot we don't know about what's happening there. We will, of course, keep you updated as we learn more. 
Well, efforts by the Obama administration to unmask U.S. citizens unwittingly caught up in intelligence efforts, in other words, people who are spied upon and didn't know it, appear to be much greater than anybody knew or even guessed. According to sources interviewed by Fox News, Samantha Power, who was Obama's U.N. ambassador from 2013 to 2017 and a political aide before that, made almost daily requests to unmask the identities of U.S. citizens, often with no obvious reason for doing so. Power previously has denied any role in leaking classified information about U.S. citizens. Joel Rubin was a deputy assistant secretary of state under President Obama, and he joins us tonight. Joel, thanks a lot for coming on. My pleasure. Thanks, Tucker. So this is exactly the kind of scenario the rest of us were assured would not happen when one of these periodic debates about spying on American citizens breaks out. For instance, the NSA. We were told, look, there's no chance anyone's going to spy on you. And if you're talking to someone who's being spied upon, your identity will remain secret. And now we find that a very political, political appointee, Samantha Power, with no background in foreign policy, by the way, she's just appointed to this position, was unmasking people at the rate of more than one a day. What could possibly be the legitimate explanation for that? Well, Tucker, it's interesting. I was a career officer in a classified position during the Bush administration right. at the State Department, and we would oftentimes read intelligence reports. In fact, first thing in the morning, we would do what they call read-in, and sometimes names would show up that were American, but they would be blacked out, and so one wouldn't see it. And, and that's essentially, that's masking. Uh, but what happens is the Americans end up getting caught up in surveillance when the U.S. is targeting adversaries. And at the U.N., there are many adversaries. As you know, there are many countries who want to do us harm. So if our government is surveilling those countries and American names show up, that's what happens, and those names get masked. And it's very important to understand what is going on. Are these Americans being targeted by these governments? Are these Americans up to no good? And that's oftentimes really what's going on. So how many terror attacks do you think Samantha Power thwarted by unmasking the names of over 200 Americans? Honestly, uh, it, it's, it's not Samantha Power unmasking the names. Uh, what would happen oh. is there would be a request into the FBI, uh, the National Security Agency, whether or not to unmask. They determine whether or not those names get unmasked. And uh, an official, a diplomat in, in this position can't ask to target or identify certain individuals and follow them. Uh, there really are rules to, of the road in, in how this proceeds doesn't seem like it. And just to be totally clear, in contrast with you, Samantha Power is not a career diplomat. She was a very low-level journalist, a freelancer, and then she was an Obama staffer. And at some point, she worked at Harvard as an academic. So she's a political person. Don't yes. you think that we should be a little uncomfortable that she put in a request of more than one a day for an unmasking as a political person? That doesn't bother you at all? Well, if, if her role was as a political person, I, I could see your point, but she was the American ambassador to the U.N. It's a cabinet-level position. She had strong bipartisan okay. support in Congress, and uh, she has to be looking out for our national security at the U.N., and there are bad guys at the U.N. There is North Korea, there's Iran, there's Russia, China, uh, Saudi Arabia. Right. These countries are looking to do harm to the United States in many instances, and we should know what they're up to and who they're talking to, and if they're American okay, but, names popping up, that's a question that, that needs to be uh, figured out. Yeah, I mean, I think these were American, by definition, I think that these were American names, but yeah. I mean, we, don't we, we have a Fourth Amendment, don't we, that says that you can't do it. This is a criminal investigation, and I'm the, you know, the investigator. Yes. I come upon information for which I don't have a warrant. I can't use that in the prosecution. I have to put that aside because I don't have a warrant. She didn't have a warrant for this stuff. Like, how does she get an exemption from the Fourth Amendment just because she's like Samantha Power? See, I, I'm not sure that's that's actually what happened, and, and uh, I don't believe that we have seen leaks of names. Uh, and, and frankly, I don't know where the numbers are coming from that that we're we're discussing because it sounds like there's leaking going on about this the, this uh, activity. But uh, it, it appears that and uh, it appears that this was held in classified setting, as it should be. And then it had continued to hit, uh, stay in classified setting. I'll, I'll leave it at that. But these are classified discussions. I don't think we've seen a plethora of American names coming out in the press uh, of folks who were surveilled. Well, actually, we have. I mean, you, you, saw, you saw it with a number of people in this administration 
who have been impugned. And, you know, maybe they did something wrong. I don't really know. But all the information that we have right. about what they did or didn't do comes in the form of leaks. I mean, here's the bottom line. Yes. The intel yeah, community I, is I, now I acting as a political player in our country, okay? So is that a good thing? Are they, not, are they supposed to be doing that? I didn't think that was their role at all. Uh, I, I would be the first person to agree with you that leaks are dangerous and we need to ensure that uh, there is no leaking. We don't know the source of the leaking of these names, and that's very important. There are two congressional investigations. I was a congressional staffer. Congress is notorious for leaking, as you know. Uh, uh, but we do need to ensure that uh, names and identities are protected and that if investigations are underway, that the investigations go forward without that kind of noise happening. I, I do agree with that. Yeah. I mean, I hope Michael Flynn did something wrong because his life has been destroyed by those well, leaks. Well, he, Joel, he, yeah. Go ahead, Tucker, please. Yes. Well, I mean, I, we're out of time, but we just, we, you know, we don't know anything other than what we're leaked and like people are getting hurt. So I hope they're guilty. Good to see you tonight. Thank you, Joel, for that. My pleasure. Thanks. Congressmen in both parties are finding themselves under attack by radical left-wing protesters. Up next, we'll talk to one, a member, a sitting member of Congress who says his home was attacked by a group of activists. Stay tuned. You've asked questions. You have questions. Even top Democrats aren't safe from aggressive protesters on the left. Just this week, House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi had to flee a press conference after he was surrounded and shouted down by a mob. Watch this. Yes, I am. You do not. You don't know what you're talking about. So that's a Democrat, the top Democrat in the House, dealing with the left. What's it like to be a Republican? Well, Congressman Jason Lewis can speak to that. He is one. He represents Minnesota. Recently, his home was besieged by 19 protesters whom he said invaded his property and scared his neighbors. Congressman Lewis joins us tonight for a recap. Congressman, thanks for coming on. Uh, you bet, Tucker. Good to be here. So what happened exactly? Well, I'm down in the district and I get a text from my neighbor said, hey, Jason, there's 19, 20, 25 people on your front lawn, on your front step, screaming and yelling. His daughters were home next door. They got scared, called their dad, who called the police. They left, I believe, before the police got there. But these are people that don't think the rules apply to them. I was elected as a Republican, but now I don't govern as a very, very liberal Democrat. Why, they reserve the right to crash our office in violation of security protocol, to crash a town hall and prevent other people from speaking, and even trespass and violate a city ordinance. So it's getting a little bit out of control. Coming to your house seems especially threatening. I mean, if people behave in a rude way in public, I don't like it. But your house is yours, and that seems like a private sphere that they're violating. What, what did you do in response? Well, I tell you what I did in response. I put up a Facebook post, and I went public and saying I was absolutely appalled, and this has got to stop. Everybody condemns violence on the right. After Charlottesville, we all condemn that. Where are the Democratic leaders, leaders especially now after Pelosi's experience, condemning this, this dangerous movement on the left? And it is becoming dangerous, make no mistake. Did you tell them to get the hell off your lawn? Well, I wasn't there. No, no, I wasn't there. I, oh, I oh, you, oh, you never went home. Okay. No, no, I, yeah. I wasn't there at the time. My neighbor texted me and said his daughters were concerned. They contacted yeah. him, and then he called the police. I got home after they, they were gone, and luckily my family wasn't home at the time either. Who were these people? This is a group funded by a big uh, public union, SEIU, uh, called Take Action uh, Minnesota. They also crashed our office. Uh, they've been doing this ratcheting and up. I think there's a, Tucker, I think there's a collective temper tantrum being thrown by people who didn't win the last election. And they keep ratcheting right. things up because they're not getting an ear. So, well, we'll crash the office. We'll videotape in the office when we're not supposed to. We'll crash the town hall and, and not let other people talk in productive dialogue. And if that doesn't work, why, we'll trespass and will invade somebody's home. Uh, there needs to be leadership from the Democratic side of the aisle to say, you know what, enough of this. So they've got your home address. These are labor people. But imagine if they'd been Antifa people in masks with bear spray, two by fours, knives, the kind of things they brought to public rallies recently. Why wouldn't that happen? Why wouldn't that start happening? And what are you going to do if it does? Well, I think a 
I, I think the town hall uh, situation is why it's not going to happen. Well, I shouldn't say it's not going to happen, but the reason that so many Republicans are scaling back on town halls is precisely because of what you describe might happen. Um, they want right. to hold the first Democratic or left-wing rally of 2018 and call it a town hall. That's not free speech. That's nothing to do with the town hall. So, you know, if it could happen at a town hall, yeah, you're right. I think it could happen anywhere. So when you're in Washington in the Congress and you see your colleagues on the other side, Democrats, do you ever say, you know, a bunch of your supporters showed up at my house and, and screamed obscenities on my lawn and scared my neighbor's kids? You know, maybe you should pull them back a little bit. Do you ever say that to them? Well, I've mentioned it a couple of times, but these people are ideologues. They're dedicated to a cause, and they need these left-wing activists. I think they know that. Look, look at Medicare for All. This is socialized medicine, Tucker. A few decades ago, right. that would have been the kiss of death in the Democratic Party. Now, Democrats are falling all over themselves to have government-run and controlled health care. This is the base of the Democratic Party today, I'm sorry to say. It is no longer right. Scoot I mean, Jackson or JFK's Democratic Party. No, are you kidding? They'd be yelled off the stage as bigots. But it's one thing to have kooky views and to have, you know, believe in economic theories that don't work. But it's the violent undertone. That seems like a new development to me. Uh, actually, if you're as old as I am, it's not. Remember the SDS? Remember the Symbionese Liberation Army? The Weather yeah. Underground? The Democratic Convention of 1968? There has always been this strain of righteousness that okays violence within the hard left. And the 1960s were proof positive of that. And unfortunately, we may be revisiting that again. Congressman, thank you. It's horrifying. You bet. Well, the, the case of Debbie Washerman Schultz, rogue IT aides keep getting stranger. Up next, we'll tell you about the women in his life who repeatedly call police to report Awan's violent, threatening behavior. Plus, Hillary Clinton says it's time to overturn two centuries of tradition and get rid of the Electoral College. We'll talk to a radio show host who says, good call, let's do just that. Stay tuned. We've got an update on the increasingly bizarre story of Imran Awan. He's the IT worker who remained on Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz's payroll, even after he was determined to be a security threat and was only fired after being arrested on federal charges while trying to flee the country. Not a good sign. Wasserman Schultz has since suggested that Awan was only targeted because, of course, racism, racial profiling, Islamophobia. She didn't bother to explain how that works. Meanwhile, Awan's attorney insists his client is, quote, a husband and a father, not a political pawn. Also, pretty predictable response. Now, police reports obtained by the Daily Caller News Foundation show that the women in Awan's life repeatedly reported him to the police. One woman, one woman accused him of treating her like, quote, a slave. Awan's stepmother said Awan had kept her imprisoned at home and threatened her by saying that as a congressional staffer, he had the power to tap her phone, hurt her family members, even have her kidnapped. A third woman called the police after a domestic dispute, and although no arrest was made in the end, a police officer at the scene saw dried blood on Awan's hand. Well, the Daily Caller News Foundation contacted all 17 Democratic women who once employed Awan services seeking comment on all of this. 15 of them refused to reply at all. Well, Hillary Clinton went on her recent book tour to tell America what happened. And it turns out that what happened is that Hillary Clinton became the country's biggest sore loser. In a recent interview with CNN, she called for the abolition of the Electoral College, which for 230 years has dictated the election of U.S. presidents. Watch this. Do you think the Electoral College should be abolished? I said that in 2000, after what happened to uh, the 2000 election with Al Gore. We've moved toward one person, one vote. That's how we select winners. I was amused after the French elections when I was listening to an interview with a French electoral expert. And he said, well, unlike your country, the person who wins the most votes wins. So I think it needs to be uh, eliminated. I'd like to see us move beyond it. Yes. Leslie Marshall is a talk radio show host, and she agrees with Hillary that we ought to abolish the Electoral College, and she joins us tonight. Leslie, good to see you. Good to see you, Tucker. So pardon my skepticism, but 
this <laughs> last election seems to have changed the views of liberals on many things. I mean, I for almost my entire life, liberals supported Russia, particularly when it was Soviet Russia. Now they're against it because Hillary blames Russia for her loss. The Electoral College has functioned, you know, for a couple of centuries. We're a prosperous, happy country. Now we have to abolish it because she doesn't like it. Can you look right into the camera and say, if Hillary had lost the popular vote but won the Electoral College, you'd be for abolishing it? Actually, I would, Tucker, because before I was a Democrat, do not faint, when I was in college and I was an independent, mm -hmm. I was against the Electoral College then, and I still am now, regardless of the outcome of the election. Now, I must admit, in our history, five uh, elections have gone right. against Democrats and favored Republicans uh, with the Electoral College uh, versus the popular vote. Uh, but that's honestly not why. As a Democrat, of course, I'll, I'll take the advantage if it comes up. But I don't think it's an advantage. I think it's a disadvantage. I'm in a state, for example, here in California, where numerous people will say, my vote doesn't count. And that includes many Republicans who are like, it's just going to go to the Democratic candidate anyway. And, and unfortunately, that's true. There is something to one voice, one vote. I believe, and I, I love a democracy, a true democracy, and even though we operate as a republic, I would like to see a majority rule, even if my candidate loses. And by the way, the president himself, huh. back in 2012, said the Electoral College was a disaster for democracy, and he changed his <laughs> mind as well. So it's not just us liberals who change their minds. Oh, I'm not surprised. Uh, then, I mean, let's <laughs> take what you're saying seriously. If we're going to have a one-man, one-vote system, pure democracy, as you said, real democracy, then we've got to abolish the Senate because it's not, of course, democratic. A senator from California represents 40 million people. A senator from Wyoming represents a little over half a million. It's not one voice, one vote, as you put it. It's totally skewed. So you'd get rid of the Senate, right? Well, I think when you have progress in a nation and you change, certainly our country has changed in the past 230 years, uh, from the late 1700s till now. I mean, not just our, our demographics, uh, not just how many states do we have now compared to then. I, I Honestly, and I know they're going to get mad at me in Rhode Island, uh, but to have two people representing Rhode Island and two people, you mentioned the state I'm in, of California, representing the population of this state, uh, which is larger than some nations throughout the world. No, I, I don't. I don't think it's right. And and and, and I know you're okay, going to. So, but are you this. ready for this? The two-party no, system I mean, is a bit archaic to, as well. So okay. let's change I it. Mean, then maybe you just progress. want a. Do you want a direct democracy? You ready for the consequences, though? Because gay marriage wouldn't be the law of the land. It lost in California, as you know. Global warming, not even a concern for most people. You'd never get a carbon tax under a direct democracy. And you have to change the population of the country. So, in other words. The idea that the majority rules, it, you know, it's a great idea, and I'm for it. I'm more on the populist side, but a pure democracy would disenfranchise rich liberals, the ones who run the Democratic Party, completely. Their ideas have no popular support. Uh, is that a concern for you? I don't think their ideas have no populist support. And I understand what you're saying about a vote here in California. You have to look at the demographic of the voters, and you have to look at also the, the language of that ballot measure here in California. Okay. On a, on yeah, a national true, scale, happened. on a national scale, polls show that most liberal social issues um, are actually uh, viewed favorably by both left and right, whether it's legalizing marijuana, uh, gay marriage, um, and, and things like that. And honestly, Tucker, most fiscal issues left and right are, are more so agreed on. People are even Democrats, even myself, are a bit more fiscally uh, conservative. So I, I think it would work out. And quite frankly, I want everyone to feel that they have a voice. And in this state of California, where I live, oh, and in the yeah. rest of the states in this country, I know many people don't vote. Look at how few people vote in our elections, just, not just I'm our laughing. presidential elections, I'm laughing our local elections. Because people voted this time. The public said it wanted something different. They elected Trump, and like everyone in L.A. has been how many having people an voted ever since. How many people voted? <laughs> Oh, how many people few. voted? Do it, Leslie, uh, I don't know. The amount of people that can vote, how many people right, voted yeah. in this election? A Compared to the numbers and percentages percentage, in other countries. You know, people, because yes. people who care vote. I'm happy with that. Leslie Marshall, thank you for joining us tonight. <laughs> Great to see you. Thank you, Tucker. You too. Well, Christian T-shirt business is being sued because it wouldn't make shirts for a gay pride parade. The store's owner has been denounced. He's in legal trouble. He'll be joining us next to explain what's going on. Stay tuned. This country has had sex offender registries for an awfully long time, but now a new form of registry is being considered in a lot of places, a registry for animal abusers. 
Last year, Tennessee became the first state to create a public registry of people who abuse animals. Similar registries exist in several major places, including Chicago's Cook County. Statewide laws have been proposed in Massachusetts, Arizona, and elsewhere. You've got to hope that a lot of other states will join Tennessee in doing this. Animals are basically powerless. You can do whatever you want to them, which is why you shouldn't. Your relationship with them is governed only by empathy, and the public ought to have a way of knowing who among us doesn't have it, who among us thinks it's okay to abuse or torture those weaker than them. It should matter, the people who do that. If you'll hurt an animal, it says a lot about how you'll treat people. Well, a print shop in Kentucky is under siege tonight because its owner, who's a Christian, doesn't want to endorse a gay pride event. Blade, Blaine Adamson is the founder and owner of Hands On Originals. It's in Lexington, Kentucky. In 2012, he declined to print a series of gay pride t-shirts for an upcoming gay pride festival. He says he serves gay customers all the time. He even employs gay employees, but he doesn't want to print materials that conflict with his religious beliefs. And for that, he spent the past five years in court. Lane Adamson joins us tonight, along with Kristen Wagoner of Alliance Defending Freedom, the legal group, the biggest in the world, doing this kind of work. They're representing him in court. Welcome to you both. Hey, thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank, thank you for coming on. So, Blaine, uh, the, the obvious question first, you say that it's not a question of disliking gay people, but that you have a relig religious uh, problem with this. Explain that, if you would. Absolutely. I'll, I'll print for anybody. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what message. I mean, it doesn't matter who you are, what your belief system is. What matters is what message you're asking me to print. And at Hands On right. Originals, we've shown over the history of our company that we employ gay employees and, and we also print uh, for gay, gay people. It, it just depends on the message that they ask us to print. And one specific example, the very Pride Festival that we had the issue with, there was a lesbian band called Mother Jane, and we printed shirts for them for that event. It, again, it wasn't because they performed at the event. It wasn't about who they are. It was about what messages were being asked to print. And we find that we have to decline messages often because of my convictions. So you, it, it has here in your bio that you've declined to print shirts you thought were anti-Christian, but you've also declined yes. to print messages you thought were anti-gay. Absolutely. Um, one in particular was a shirt that just said homosexuality is sin. And it was a pastor. And, you know, for me, I just don't think Jesus would have gone about, about it that way. You know, Jesus was a master of balancing grace and truth. And so my conscience did, just didn't feel like that was something I wanted to print. You don't seem like someone who should be sued over this. Kristen, I'm a little bit confused because we do have the First Amendment. Can't someone say what he wants or not say what he wants? Can you really compel someone to say something he doesn't believe? Well, you're absolutely right. The Constitution protects Blaine and others. It protects the right of creative professionals not to be forced to create messages, to express messages, or to celebrate events that violate their core convictions. And that freedom, if we want that freedom for ourselves, then we have to extend it to those with whom we disagree. I mean, could I be sued for not writing a certain kind of novel or not having a certain kind of guest on this show? I'm, I'm serious. Could well, I be by the left? You're spot on, Tucker, because these kinds of laws will be applied to the left as well as the right. Can a Republican speechwriter be forced to write for a Democrat? We're seeing these laws be applied across the United States, and if there's a case right now pending at the Supreme Court that has similar issues, and it's whether someone can be forced to express messages and convey ideas that violate the core of who they are. See, I, I would think that gay rights groups and Christian groups and everyone would agree with what you just said, I, I think. So, uh, Blaine, quickly, how has this affected your life? Five years, you're probably not making millions printing T-shirts. I mean, this has got to be pretty tough on you, I would think. Well, it's just one of those things you kind of get through, and, you know, we just continue on doing what we love to do, which is print T-shirts. And we, you know, I love doing what I do, so we just keep keeping on. But, Tucker, one of the unique hey. aspects of Blaine's case is that people of both sides are on Blaine's side. And so right. we do have hope that tolerance is a two-way street here. You know, there, well, and, they, and they, they absolutely ought to be. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but I, I really wish you both luck on this. Thank you very much. Blaine Christian. Thank, thank you. Appreciate Thanks. it. Up ahead, President Trump has had plenty of critics who compare him to some of the worst figures in world history. 
One of those critics, though, had a surprisingly different attitude a few years ago. <laughs> we found an amazing tape. you got to watch this. Stay tuned.